Hello and welcome to the Guest EdTech Virtual Summit Dubai. Thank you for joining us. We're pleased to introduce you to Philippa Raithmel, Head of Digital Education and Strategy at Cranley Abu Dhabi. We hope that you enjoy the session and over to you, Philippa. Hi everybody and welcome to my session um, about safeguarding your digital environment and how to grow a whole school culture. Um, as many of you will know, um, safeguarding is a core pillar of everything that we do in a school and in our school our motto is from culture comes strength and I think that really is resonant with a many uh, broad ranging schools across the world and it's so so important that we build this culture of safeguarding as the most important thing and safeguarding is making sure that we have the plans in place that if anything happens, we know what to do. So it's preempting the things that uh, we uh, don't want to happen, but knowing that if they do, we have a solution. And that's why um, safeguarding our whole digital environment is so important because safeguarding 20 years ago, 10 years ago, was not as online as it is now. Um, people didn't have as many mobile phones, people didn't have as much access to the internet. Um, and when we mix in our traditional um, safeguarding concerns, along with digital technology and online life, we begin to see much greater risk. And so digital safeguarding as being part of safeguarding is incredibly important to making sure that every single person in your community is safe and is aware and is able to make the best decisions and the most accurate decisions about how to ensure students are safe online, safe in class and safe at home. So what you can see in front of you is that the students are at the heart of everything we do within a school. They most definitely are at Cranley Abu Dhabi. They are our, our pastoral care is, is um, something in which we, we are very, very proud of. And that really takes into account all of these other, what I've always called bubbles, although that seems a little bit strange now, um, where we have parents and carers and we have to make sure that one, our students are, are protected so that our parents um, can support them. Um, and we make sure that our TAs and our governors and our senior leadership and our teachers are all safeguarding trained annually. At Cranley Abu Dhabi, we go that little extra mile and we actually get our parents involved with a lot of training. And one of those new aspects that we've brought along is actually online safety training. And we're very proud to be a national online safety school, which has allowed us to be able to train parents in the same way. And digitalizing our, our online learning so much during COVID has meant that we really, really need to take that seriously and take it to the next level. So we make sure that we have all of these bubbles around the student to make sure that even the students themselves know the importance of safeguarding. So why is safeguarding our digital environment so scary? And I think it really comes from this kind of concept of there being a bit of a loophole. So I've always talked about within um, digital education of this, this loophole, this kind of gap of knowledge, this skills gap where we have teachers and parents who, for the best part of their lives, didn't have digital technology around them. They didn't go to school. We didn't go to school. I didn't go to school having a mobile phone in my hand and a tablet in my bag, coming home, logging onto a game and playing on, or, you know, for hours on end, chatting away to my friends. I come from the dial-up days where I would have to argue with my brothers about who would be allowed to have the next or the first half hour online whilst I wanted to go on MSN Messenger. And it's, it's from those days that actually we start to see where it builds up from because bullying and things started to happen online. Um, but it, it wasn't really seen as being part of a school because, well, that happened at home. And now we are at the stage where that bullying never goes away because students have always got access to digital technology. And, and I'm going to talk in a moment about, um, about how serious it can get in terms of safeguarding. But if we think about it from, from the bully perspective, we straight away, we take away all of those different things that may well stop a bully from bullying. Um, you know, the peers around them, the teacher in front of them, they're straight away, they have that direct access to the person that they would like to make, um, to make unhappy. And, and so we, 
we need to be as educators much more aware of that and part of that is about training staff to have more confidence in using digital technology and about it being as simple as possible so that, that teacher doesn't need to know every single in and out of it but that they do need to have a basic understanding of how to use digital technology because all of the children in front of them are using it. And whether we come from a very low income school in a low income area, it doesn't stop those children from having access and actually probably gaining access to a lot more than we think than it does if we're in a one to one device environment where we think we are perhaps safeguarding every single element of it. And so we need to kind of break down that idea of fear factor and we need to start talking about safeguarding as though it's just something that happens every day because it is. We do and we need to be focusing on safeguarding in every aspect of the children's lives, whether it's walking out into a road or whether it's logging on online. And we need to make sure we break down those boundaries. So I'm going to talk to you today about some things that we've done at Cranley to be able to put those in place. Um, I work incredibly closely with our head of wellbeing and, um, and she's also the head of uh, safeguarding lead um, to be able to bring that digital technology into the mix of that. And it's no longer just a, a caveat line of, you know, uh, and dig digital technology or and online. It's now a full part of what we do and everything we do. So... Shockingly, and there's a few slides here that I, I'm going to kind of give you some specific material, and this is about the UK. Um, we obviously know as educators, we were all thrown online. Um, many schools have increased um, fourfold in terms of what they deliver online and the content they deliver. But how many of us know that our students are online and they're on the right access and they have the right information in front of them? How many of them are being WhatsApped and message and um, from who they think is their teacher, giving them information to log on to something? How many of them are, are logging in and talking to teachers who are being put in a position where perhaps they have to use their own personal email address or whether the, the teacher may well um, have to be using their own personal device? And again, that is something really important. Very, very strongly at Cranley, we've made the decision that every member of staff should be using a school device. And that school device should be allowing them to be safeguarded themselves. And... And that is so, so important because we don't want that mix of cloud accounts. We all have our own personal lives and our own personal accounts. We don't want to be in a position or a situation where an image has been uploaded and transferred into the wrong place. And I don't mean an image that's inappropriate. I just mean an image from within your classroom because that could be taken out of context for any teacher. And it's not about accusing and being accusational to these people, to teachers, to educators, whose job it is and passion it is to safeguard children and to keep them safe and to educate them to have better lives. It's about protecting our staff as well. And without that awareness that, that you know, an iCloud can mix or a Google Drive could mix, we're not doing a good enough service to our staff. So that's really important, that's something really important to me and that's something we've pushed out here. So during lockdown, there has been an increase of online abuse and I, you know, the statistics have not yet come out in terms of the whole of, of, the, of what's happened during COVID. Um, but there has been an, an increase in, in activity online, in child sex abuse, in um, predators online, in online bullying and these children sometimes don't know what's happening and why it's happened until it's too late. And so we really need to consider that. We need to think about how safe our children are when we're letting them log on. As a school, I have a huge kind of pressure, I think, is, is the word for schools that they have to. If you're going to hand out a device or even request that a child brings a device into your school, we as educators should be thinking and have foresight to say, okay, what do they need to know? What do the parents of that child need to know? And what are my expectations when they come into that classroom? In the UAE, we're very lucky that it's a very strict law that they do not take photographs of anyone without permission. In fact, if we go quite um, further into that, the law actually states that unless you have written permission from a person, so it can be very tricky water to be going treading. And we need to make sure that children understand that. Do they know that taking a photograph or sharing an image, even if they are not the person who took it, is illegal in this country? 
And those countries where it is not illegal, do children really know what that means for them and what that means for the rest of their lives? Do they understand their digital footprint and how important their digital footprint is in keeping it safe and keeping it clean? And do they understand that sending a picture of themselves or sharing an image will not go away? And do we as adults know that? Do we understand the technicalities that come behind sharing and having a digital footprint? And I think that's really important to think about as well. When we put children online and we ask them to go online to have their lessons, when we ask them to go online to look for things, for information, we immediately put them at risk. And as educators, we should be thinking about that and we need to make sure that when we are planning lessons, we are directing them to the right places. As a school, we need to make sure our firewalls are safe and secure and that we actually have all of the things in place to keep our children safe. And that when they are at home, we are giving the best advice to those parents. And that's where things like the skills gap come in. And I mentioned it before, it's about sharing with your community what the potential dangers are and having that as something which you would like them to have conversations with at home. Reinforcing building structures for parents at home, giving them the power and allowing them to have the skills as well. So for instance, we are launching a um, short videos, five minutes maximum, on how to set up things like screen time in your school. Um, on a range of devices, we may well go with one device, but we know that at home those devices are, there's a multitude of them. And even if our computers are one thing, it doesn't mean that our children are not playing on a computer game somewhere else. And do we really know who they're talking to? And when they say they're talking to a friend, how do they know that it's their friend and have they made sure? And are we asking the right questions around those different things? And so we as a school are building the skills. So we're bridging that gap so we can make sure that everybody is safeguarded. So what does digital safeguarding look like? It has to be spoken about. It has to be built into everything we do so that in our minds and in our head, we are constantly considering the best way forward and making sure that children are mentally prepared and that their mental well-being is supported as well. As I've already said, we have an incredible um, head of well-being who takes digital technology very seriously as well. And it's about creating those links with people within the senior teams and within the school to make sure that those elements are also taken care of. It's about making sure that with their hands they know what to do. They know that they're putting in safe passwords. They know that they are going to make sure that every part of their lives is also safe. So does your IT team know how to be able to support that as well? Because quite often we expect our IT team to not necessarily get us involved with the education side of things and actually that in itself is really important because perhaps if they don't understand the full goings on they don't understand why that's important and if they don't understand why that's important they might know how to do something which could benefit your school and haven't brought that up because they didn't know it was relevant so bringing in your IT team to have those conversations with your, your teaching staff, your pastoral staff, with your um, operational staff is incredibly important as well to be able to bring those conversations together. Because as teachers, we don't always know what is right and what is best because it's not our specialism, if you like. And then it's also about the heart. So that for me is, is, is the whole safeguarding together. It's about giving them the information to make sure that they can be a full child to the best of their ability and to not be harmed or given information too early which may take away their childhood and it's not about doing that it's not about saying this is scary and this is scary and this will happen and if you don't do this this will happen it's about building it into your curriculum it's about building it into those tutorial times it's about having conversations with them openly within reason depending on your school or giving the power to the parents to be able to have those conversations and saying it's okay to have that conversation because it's scary and we want to protect our children. So safeguarding as we know it is neglect, physical abuse, mental abuse and sexual abuse and all of those things can happen online. As educators, we need to embed digital safeguarding into everything that we do. Whether we're advising them to go on a platform 
or whether we are handing out a document with a link on to take them to somewhere to research. Is it accurate? Have we been on it ourselves? Did we know that it came from a reputable source? Are we teaching them what a reputable source is? And even down to things like phishing. Do they know what that is? Do they, would they know what a scam was? Would they know what to look out for? And this sort of information cannot just be relied upon for your IT department or your computer science department any longer. This is part of the world. This is part of working out whether news is real or fake working out whether an image has been distorted. That's the sort of thing you can do in art. Fake news, English, straight away. Geographical locations, looking at Google Maps, being able to plan out where and how things might happen. And then having conversations about where in that world, well, what kinds of things might those people be worried about? What kinds of things might happen to those people in that area? Do they have internet and what is that like? And how would they communicate with the rest of the world? And all of these things can link nicely and softly into a curriculum. So as I mentioned earlier, there are obviously the, the more um, serious sides of safeguarding as well as we get right down to the nitty gritty of it. What we need to think about is that when we have an offender, they have many barriers in front of them. And this is why digital safeguarding becomes so important. Because as soon as you remove those barriers by being online, they don't have people there to say, oh no, stop doing that, or I'm not sure you're looking at that person the right way, or you know you're not allowed to take a photograph of that person. And those things are removed. Those things that we would normally do in school, we would normally report somebody or see something happening or feel incredibly uncomfortable about a certain scenario, those things are not happening any longer and straight away they go from being a motivator to offend to having one wall. They now don't need to hurdle several walls because digital technology, sadly, also empowers people to have that one stage and all they need is a small bit of motivation. And as educators and, and leaders in our schools, we need to make sure we break down that and we add in layers. We add in questioning from parents as to whether they should be on that. What time are they online till? What are they doing and who are they talking to? In the same way that we need to build those relationships and conversations within school. In tutor time, should we be sharing information online? But such and such said they shared and was that a good idea? And how's that? Why would we not share our address? All of these questions can start to come into play and they can start to build digital walls to stop people from offending online. So, what does your community need? I would suggest that starting with something like NSPCC, it's an incredible UK website because they have a self-assessment form. They have a self-assessment grid that you can tick and cross and have a look and it will literally pull out anything that you need to focus on. And that's just a really great way of one kind of going, yeah, I'm doing that, that's brilliant. I'm, and you know, we're, we're further along than we thought. And it's also really, really useful and valuable to make sure that you can signpost where you are not currently safe. Link your safeguarding policies with other policies that you have. Develop roles for people. Make, if somebody is interested in doing online safety training, digital safeguarding training, allow them to do it. As I've mentioned before, we use national online safety and that allows us with our um, community to allow anybody, whether they're a governor, a cleaner, a canteen worker, a TA, a parent, a senior leader, specific role in senior leadership even. So we have special um, training online for SEN. We have special training for our digital um, champion leads. We have training for just general teachers, teachers who have more of a specific role within pastoral care. And they're all different levels and different abilities and different amounts of information that you might need to know. Um, bringing those people in just widens that understanding and that education behind what online safeguarding is. It helps you to manage risks for the future. Then I would say to you that you and your safeguarding lead should be working together and looking at, along with IT, reducing platforms. The more platforms we have, the more information, the more data is going out to people. And do we always know that we're using a reputable educational source? Have we checked? Who has checked? And sometimes this may feel like an extra layer into people's daily lives but it's a huge part of safeguarding your environment. 
as educators, we like, you know, I, I love to be very innovative and kind of go and oh, I found this, I'm going to use it. But more recently, over the past few years, I've learned actually sometimes it's worth asking those questions. It's worth having a little search and popping it into common sense media and seeing if that's appropriate and whether the age boundaries are appropriate. And it's worth pushing it out to staff and saying, have you seen this before? And is this a, is this a maths game or is it actually something else? And do we know anything about it? And well, I've heard it was banned in the UK, but it's still here. But is that OK? And can I use it then? These questions should be being asked of all the platforms that we work with and use. And, and when we are giving out our data and our information, how much are we giving out and how much are they storing? And that's something really important to consider as well. Work with agencies, even the UAE here, as, as new as the UAE is, we're not even at our 50th year of being the UAE, we have an incredible um, outreach of agencies here and we can talk to them and bring up inf information with them if we find something as a school, but also network with those schools, talk to one another, find out things that we can help each other with and finally give ownership to those students. Have a team of students who this is what they do, this is what they work on because when they're talking to each other, they will pull things out that you never even heard of. And if you've not heard of it, they're probably using it all the time. And that's the sort of thing that we need to know about. So thinking about data, do you have a responsible usage policy? Have you told students if they're a BYOD, so bring your own device, do they have to sign up to it as well? Do you make sure you've got monitoring software? And if you don't, do you have parental permission to make sure that you can go onto that computer and check within reason, if anything has happened, so that you are taking control and making sure that you're safe. Are you, especially in a country like this, making sure it's really clear that things like VPNs are not legal? And they shouldn't be using them, and we, we in our policy, have a very strict um, line in it which says, VPNs are not legal here. You, if you are using it for school, should not have one. Because again, our firewall is about safe, keeping them safe, safety, for everyone, every child. Every parent has different rules. That doesn't mean that someone else's parents' rules should rule your child as well. And as educators, again, we need to remember that is every child in our school is gonna be different. And some will be allowed to do more and some will be allowed to do less, but we need to think of them all as the same and we need to safeguard them to the same standards. Do you use a device management system? Do you have homeschool agreements? Do you share homeschool agreements where parents maybe need that extra bit of support in terms of how they can actually help at home so they can start to do that. And that's a really, really nice tool to be able to share with parents who perhaps are struggling or just proactive parents who want to have those in place before they give them digital devices at home. And are we, and this is really important, always recommending age-appropriate apps? It's not about, like I just mentioned, what we think and whether we think a child is ready. If the ruling has been stated that it is not appropriate for a certain age. As a school, we have to do that and we have to make sure that we are strict and stringent with those different regulations because, again, we are the ones that should be upholding those moral values and making sure they're passed on to the students. If different things are made at home, different decisions are made at home, that is out of our control. But within school and within conversations within school, we can make sure we're really strict on that. So step one is safeguarding and digital training. And then step two is about bringing your parents and carers in, having drop-in sessions, having workshops, having those questions. And then three is student awareness. Because then they can go back to their parents and say, I'm not sure about this and I spoke about this or we weren't allowed to talk about this in school, why? And actually we've empowered parents then and we've empowered staff and we can make sure we are safeguarding fully. So, as I've mentioned a few times, we're a National Online Safety School and we get our staff to do National Online Safety training every year. I, as an educator, continually use common sense media. I think it's brilliant as a parent and as an educator to be able to just tap in a, a new app, a new um, a blog, um, look at podcasts. It recommends lots of different um, well-sourced items to be using online and that's brilliant um, in terms of just being able to help people out. And the NSPCC is a UK, as we're a, a UK curriculum school, it's something that I go to quite a lot. We've got a lot of resources on there, and they are always up to date with their information and constantly doing research into how to protect children online. Um, so it's the National Society for the Prevention of Child Cruelty. Um, online safety is brilliant as well. We do Wake Up Wednesdays, so we send out information, and I can always rely on them to go in and 
find something that's going to tell me about an app or something that's maybe really popular in school. And I can share that with parents within an instant to make sure that everybody is aware of, of the, the new app, the new craze that's going around, and they are always up to date. We also embed their digital um, safety into our schools, into our um pastoral learning so we are slowly moving all the different lessons within that to be able to have conversations about that um, and some of them we found really useful for planning into our moral education lessons as well so where a moral education lesson is talking about um, online safety or devices or well-being we've always been able to go into national online safety as well to be able to find some additional information to be able to share with people so as I mentioned, National Online Safety has a range of CPD for parents, carers. We've actually um, got quite a few of our parents who've signed up and are doing ongoing training as we speak. And they have fantastic curriculum, which is led by some brilliant resources and some fantastic characters on there. You'll be hard not to uh, be engrossed by some of the primary things that are on there. It's fantastic. And there are some of the... Um, National Line Safety posters that we can send out on Wake Up Wednesday. And sometimes it's things that we've never even heard of. And, and for me, it's great to be able to send that out with some positives and also things to be aware of, which I think is always really helpful, is not always going down that negative route. Is it safe as long as we know? Things about questions online, how to search, really helpful for our parents. But most importantly, online safety, digital safeguarding, safeguarding is never just a one-up. We can't think because we've written it that it, it means that everything will stand up and hold up to that. We, As we know, digital life and online learning is ever-changing, and we cannot do anything about that. New things come up daily. Students find new things to do every day, even if it's just things like freezing their screen and adding something on that makes them look like they're in space. You know, silly things, they all come into the digital environment and digital learning making sure that every child is aware, every child is protected, but also that every child can get on with their learning without the fear that someone else could upset that and take that away from them is also really important. So some other things that are really helpful is GoBubble, incredible platform for um, primary and now even senior education, um, a kind of training wheels for, um, for social media, which is brilliant and they, also have a huge range of well-being and, and kind of kindness at the moment. They're doing a big thing about um, the kindness months and just trying to really, really draw in those key elements of what we expect from our students and trying to support them to understand how to behave online. Another resource I found was this uh, Stop Time Online. It's fantastic. There's a really great range of resources and videos that link to that. Um, the Google Be Internet Awesome is something we've embedded across our primary curriculum as well. There's some brilliant interactive games, which the students absolutely love, but it really, really identifies some of those key points of online safety. Um, and again, things that sometimes teachers even turn around and say, I didn't even know that was part of it. I didn't know that existed. I'd never heard of X, Y, and Z. And I think that's really important as well is to be able to allow staff to have confidence in a curriculum and not necessarily when you first set off to expect them to create it all is in is just not um, effective when perhaps they're not as confident. I think that's really important to think about as well. And then finally, um, Nearpod, if you are a subscriber to Nearpod, you will find that their learning resources library is absolutely flooded with all kinds of different information on digital citizenship and how we can be upstanders and not bystanders. And they link really well actually with Common Sense Media and their um, support work there as well. They have a range of different videos which we use quite a lot. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is my national um, UK curriculum school. Um, we don't use it as much because it's an American curriculum, but we have used many of the resources from there and it is brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Um, as I mentioned, Safer social media for the under 13s, they have now raised that, so I probably should change that infographic eventually. Um, and it is really a really great way of parents to be able to um, allow their children to communicate with their community, which really is all children want to do online, um, in a safe way. And as I've alluded to already, I remember this from when I was a child watching Blue Peter, and it was feed a man for a day. and he will be full for the day. If you teach a man to farm and give him the ability and the tools, he will be forever full. He will be able to farm. And also, he will be empowered. And that really is, as educators, what it's all about. 
you know, we can filter a, a website and protect a student for a day. We can educate a child about online safety and parents about online safety and our teachers about online safety. And we'll protect them for a lifetime. So make sure everyone is involved. Training for all. Don't say no to somebody because they're not at a certain level. If they're interested in it, it's important. Let them do it. Scaffold the curriculum, so make sure it embeds a range of different um, elements of digital learning, digital literacy, digital safety. Um, real world scenarios are fantastic because it helps them to understand how that might happen. Try really hard not to make it so um, mythical that people wouldn't understand it. We need to make sure students re resonate with it so it's relevant to them so that they remember it. Having support circles for parents is the next step for us at Cranley, and that's something we're going to be doing a lot of. We do have community workshops, we do coffee mornings, which is fantastic, and even been able to digitalize them this year as well, but actually having those support circles for parents, because believe it or not, there's a lot of peer pressure out there for parents, and you need to remember that, and we don't want to approach it in a way that we say, this is what you should be doing, how can you not be doing that as a parent? It needs to be that open conferencing kind of style where it, we, we are there to support, we're there to listen. Because at the end of the day, not only does that help us to support that parent and that child, but it helps us to then educate the rest of the community about issues that are ongoing and that's really important. And regular teacher training. So our next steps is that every member of our community, so all of our parents, not just those ones that have jumped on at the beginning, who are super keen, um, that everybody can be trained. And some of that will take us um, making sure that they can um, have it in their own language and making sure that we are supportive to everybody. Um, some, um, there'll be digital literacy is being fully embedded across our, our school as well, which again, as I've said already, will be very, very supportive to that and help to enhance learning and understanding. And having national and safety has allowed us to empower our staff and to be able to educate them and allow them to take control of their own education to be able to have a look at things if they've heard it and encourage them to then be a little bit more knowledgeable about that and to um, and to make sure that they can take the stand as well. And most importantly, we need to encourage and support and share. So we embrace the future to keep our students safe. It's not about hiding. It's not about putting our blinds over our eyes and pretending it's not there. It's about having those conversations, no matter how difficult they are, to be able to keep our students safe. So that we end up having a group who communicate with each other and whose aim and main goal is to safeguard students. So first of all, ignite, then innovate and inspire. Share the work with your community, share the work with your schools, because we won't do this alone, we'll do it together. Because from culture comes strength. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been really useful. If you would like to know any more about digital safeguarding or anything about policies or support with digital safeguarding within your school, please reach out to me. I am at Mrs. Wraithmel on Twitter and I have designed teachdigitally.com. Um, I also host EdTech UAE, uh, which is the first Tuesday of every month. And um, I would love any educator who's interested or any safeguarding lead to come along and have a chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippa. That was brilliant. Uh, if you have any questions pertaining to this session, you can also connect with Philippa through the networking system on the virtual event platform. We'd also love to hear from you. So feel free to share any thoughts or comments by sending us an email to marketing at guesteducation.com. We'll be on social media as well during the summit. So if you want to chat to us there, follow us on Twitter at guesteducation and use the hashtags hashtag guestedtech and hashtag guestdubai. This is just one of many on-demand videos that you can watch at any time during the summit, as well as a full program of live keynotes and panel sessions across both days. We hope that you enjoyed the rest of the event. Thank you so much, and bye-bye for now. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you. Bye.